chapter 9. Now our pastor uh, quoted out of this Wednesday night, if, if you were here, I'm not going to preach his sermon, but I'm going to use that same text this morning. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I'm going to pull the thought out of that sixth verse there that said, And his name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful. Now this section of Isaiah's prophecy actually is commencing from the seventh chapter and the first verse. It is terminated in this glorious burst of glad and precious promise. The gist of the whole section is that Israel will not suffer from Pekah and Rezin. These were two kings. Their oppressors shall be Assyria and Egypt, more especially Assyria. Assyria shall overwhelm her and crush her and lay her low. And she shall remain for a time and a season in a period of gloom and darkness. But at length the darkness shall be dispelled and a great light shall shine forth first in the north and then all over the land. The rod of the oppressor shall be broken, and a child shall be born who shall bear marvelous names and rule over the kingdom of David in justice and righteousness forever. God has spoken and God will perform this. Everywhere in his history we find the blending of God and man, the God-man that was come. He was the outcast babe for whom there was no room in the inn. Yet it was angels that heralded his birth and magi offered to him the worship of that of a king. He was a simple child of 12 years old and yet the temple doctors were astonished at his understanding and his answer. He submits to John's baptism of water and yet the Spirit of God descended upon him and the voice most exceeding peace gives testimony that he is the Son of the living God. He weeps the tear of human friendship at the grave of Lazarus, but he spoke words that brought the dead to life. He died in agony and shame as only a man could die, but he raised in triumph and glory as only a God could rise. Hallelujah to God. So in this prophecy of Isaiah, the coming one is a child, but the key of government is upon his shoulder. He is a child, but yet he is a wonderful and counselor, mighty God and prince of peace. He is the son, but it is said of him that he is also the everlasting father. To show himself to man, God must come into the sphere of man, not as a cherub or an angel, but God came down into our sphere as a man. So as we read this verse number six this morning, I want to look at that quotation, his name shall be called wonderful. This is where I'll take my text this morning. Hallelujah to God. His name shall be called wonderful. And that is our subject today. His name is wonderful. When we consider the name of Jesus Christ and we consider how that it is wonderful, it is wonderful in his name. The writer of Proverbs says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and love and favor than 
and silver and gold. I can tell you this morning the name of Jesus is a good name. His name is a name that shines. His name blossoms like a thousand spring tides. It is greater than all the other names that are upon the earth. There is saving grace in his name. You can believe and ask in his name and it shall be done. There's healing in his name this morning. Just in his name alone he declares to be God's wonderful Christ. But not only is his name declare him to be wonderful, his birth declares that he is wonderful. You see, his birth was announced by an angel, not by ABC, NBC, CNN, or the Lexington Herald. It was announced by the angels of heaven. Hallelujah to God. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and his mother was the Virgin Mary. His place of birth was a stable or an ox stall. As a baby, he was known from afar. Shepherds came there to see him as Savior. Wise men came there to worship him as the giver of life, and they brought gifts, and it wasn't baby rattlers and pampers. They brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh, recognizing him as a prophet and as a king and as a priest. I guess even in his birth he was declared to be wonderful. But not only does his name and his birth reveal him to be wonderful, his life offers further evidence that he is wonderful. In the second chapter of Luke we see him talking to the doctors and to the lawyers at an age of 12. At the age of 30, he is a carpenter's son. He is the bread of life, yet he went hungry. He is the living water, but he went thirsty. He could calm the raging sea or the hand of a little child. He could preach to a multitude or to one woman sitting at a well. He had no library, but everybody has a book about him. He had no money, but all the riches of the world are built upon him. He had no home, but every Christian has a home promised in heaven. He founded no college, but never a man spake like this man. Hallelujah to God. One day he stopped a funeral procession and he raised up the dead. He healed the blinded eyes and he caused the lame to walk and the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He turned the water into wine and one day he fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and a fish. Yes, his life declares that he is wonderful today not only his life that he lived declared him to be wonderful but the teachings that he taught revealed that he's wonderful he taught the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 he opened his mouth and taught them blessed are the poor in spirit those that mourn those that meet those that hunger and thirst the merciful blessed are the pure in heart the peacemakers the persecuted and he also taught him, Matthew 5, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow, don't turn him away. And then in Matthew 19, he said, Honor your father and mother. He taught us we should love our neighbor as ourself. Amen. And then he declared, Let your light so shine before me, and that when they see your good works, they'll glorify your God in heaven. These teachings with many others that we don't have time to preach this morning offer overwhelming evidence that Jesus is God's Wonderful Christ. Amen. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ testifies that he's wonderful. His birth reveals him to be wonderful. His life speaks that he is wonderful. His teachings echo the same sentiment. But be assured this morning, we're nowhere near through yet, for there's more evidence that Jesus yeah. is the wonderful Christ. Amen. When we see him as wonderful, we observe his potentialities. As we consider his potentialities, we discover that his only pocketbook was the mouth of a fish. His only transportation was another man's animal. His cradle was an animal's manger. 
His grave was even another man's grave. Hallelujah. He gives comfort to the widow. He is a father to the orphan, to the traveler in the night. He is the bride and the morning star. To the farmer, he's the lily of the valley and the beautiful rose of Sharon. He's honey in the rock and the brightness of the Father's glory. The express image of his person. He is the purchaser of a pearl of great price. He's a rock in the weary land. He's the cup that runneth over. He's the rod and the staff that comfort me. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God. His potentialities reveal that he is wonderful. His personality reveals that he's wonderful. When we look at his personalities, we observe he never carried a sword. Yet there's more victories won in his name than other, any other leader in history. He never organized an army or a navy, but he has more soldiers than any other commander. Amen. He never studied medicine, but he can heal all manners Amen. of disease. He never attended theological seminary, but he's the preacher of all preachers. He never had a degree in education, but he's the teacher of all teachers. He never studied architecture, but he's the master builder of all builders this morning. Hallelujah. So when we observe his potentialities, we see he is revealed as wonderful. Evidence that Jesus is wonderful continues as we look at his plan to save the lost. We see the condescending Christ in John chapter 3 when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. And then we see an overview of the work of Christ in Luke chapter 19. He said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we see an overview of the earthly work of Christ in Acts chapter 10. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. We see an overview of his redemptive work in Romans chapter 5. For when yet we were without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely would a righteous man die yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Amen. for everyone that asks receives and he that asks, seeks finds and to him that knocks it's open confess, believe and ask his plan to save the lost reveals that he is God's wonderful Christ he is wonderful by his name, his birth, his life, his teachings, his potentialities, his personality, his plan to save the lost. And then we have the great testimony of his death. Even his death testifies that he was wonderful. Even in the dying hours he gave, he gave his head to the crown of thorns. He gave his back to the cruel lash. He gave his cheeks to those that plucked out his beard. He gave his face to rude human spit. He gave his shoulders to be draped with a robe of mock royalty. He gave his clothes to his murderers. He gave his hands and feet to be nailed to an old rugged cross. He gave his blood to the earth for the remission of our sins. He gave his spirit back to God that gave it. He gave his body for the life of the world and he gave himself to death. And his death, the scripture tells us that the sun and the moon and the stars refused to shine. Heavens mourned and the veil of the temple was ripped in twain. Darkness, his gloom was upon the face of the earth for about a half an hour because the wonderful son of God was dying before the whole world. But not only was he wonderful in his dying, he was wonderful in his resurrection. Yes. Hallelujah. He was wonderful in his dying, but he was wonderful in his resurrection. You know, the Roman government was against his resurrection. Unbelief was against his resurrection. Skeptics today and liberal theologians are against his resurrection. The Jewish leaders were against his resurrection. 
but he arose. I said he arose. Hallelujah to God. He came out of that grave and he said, Peter, go back to Jerusalem and tell the man that spit in my face about my wonderful salvation. He came out of the grave and said, go tell the man that whipped me with that whip that if he or any of his family gets stripped, gets sick by those stripes, he can be healed. He came out of the grave and said, go tell the man that plucked out my beard that I still love him. He came out of the grave and said, go tell the man that made that crown of thorns that drove them into my head and caused such pain and agony that I have a crown of life laid up for him. He came out of the grave and said, go tell the man uh, that made my cross so heavy uh, that if he'll follow me, I'll give him eternal life. Uh, he come out of the grave and said, uh, go tell the man that drove the spikes through my hands uh, uh, that these hands have bought him a home in heaven. Uh, hallelujah to God. He said, go tell the man that brought me vinegar and gall when I asked for water that if he'll follow me I'll give him living water he said go and tell him those hallelujah that gambled for my garment that I've got a clone of righteousness waiting for him he said go tell the world that I'm alive and that I'm alive forevermore beyond any doubt his resurrection declares that he is God's wonderful Christ. The resurrected Christ is manifest as wonderful. And he's still wonderful today. And it's manifested in him working among the works of men. Jesus lives and he's still healing the sick and afflicted. Jesus lives. And he's still bringing great salvation to the hearts of men. Jesus still lives and is still sanctifying men holy and filling them with his Holy Spirit. He is alive and he continues to give grace and power to meet the needs of all humanity. Truly, he is revealed as wonderful in the fact that he lives and continues to work among men today. But I tell you one more time before we wrap this thing up, not only was he observed to be wonderful in all these things, even in his death and in his resurrection, but I tell you what, when he comes again, he's going to be revealed as wonderful one more time. Hallelujah to God. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. When he comes again, there'll be no doubt to all this world that he's wonderful. That angel appeared to Mary and Joseph. You'll find in the narrative of the book of Matthew. The angel said, That holy thing that is in thee shall be called the Son of God. And he shall save his people from their sins. I've often pondered the thoughts of Mary and Joseph in that day and in that hour. I believe they would have known, at least been familiar with, some of the Old Testament scriptures that one day a child would be born. One day a son would be given. They would have read Isaiah chapter 7. And they would have followed up with Isaiah chapter 9. But they never would have dreamt. That's a bit of vernacular. They never would have dreamt that it would be them. Did they contemplate in their mind, was this just a happenstance? Could this really be the child that Isaiah prophesied? The Bible tells us that Mary pondered all this in her heart. And she watched him grow up. When they lost him during the census and they came back and found him in the temple speaking with the doctors and the lawyers, they were astonished. 
And they said, why? We've been looking for you everywhere. And he said, why were you looking for me everywhere? Did you not know I'd be about my father's business? And I believe they watched him grow up. I believe he says he's working in his daddy's carpentry shop. I believe that Joseph watched him with great interest. And as he became a man and he began to minister, I believe that his mama watched him as he was ridiculed and as they made him suffer and all the things that he endured. She knew something about him because in the beginning of his ministry, the first miracle that he did was because of his mama. They went to a wedding one time and his mama came and said, Jesus, uh, son, uh, they've got no wine to drink. And Jesus said, what, what have I to do with thee, woman? And uh, Mary must have said, you, you do what I tell you to do, boy. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible said that Jesus touched the water and turned it into wine. That was the beginning of his miracles. And I believe they watched with great interest as they heard stories of their son that was healing the sick and casting out devils. All the things that he done and she saw the following for three and a half years that followed him and watched him but she knew the heart of the religious and the heart of the church people and the mind that they had toward him. She was there when they beat his back with a rod and busted his head with her stick and put beard from his face and drove thorns down into his head. She was there and watched him carry that cross up that hill. His mother was there when they nailed him to that old rugged cross. Matter of fact, he looked down while he was saving the world and he looked at John and he pointed to Mary and he said, Behold thy mother. In other words, in his dying days when Jesus was saving all of humanity, he said, Somebody and take care of my mama. Hallelujah to God. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. I bet I tell you what this morning, church, when he comes the next time, he's not coming to be ridiculed. He's not coming in a manger. He won't need no room in the end. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords today. Give him a good hand clap of praise. Going to try to keep it calm down and preach like Charles Stanley this morning, but I tell you, I love this message. He is God's wonderful Christ. No matter what you do, whatever your tradition, you can have a Christmas tree in every room in your house. You can buy everybody you know a present, but there would be no Christmas had it not been for Christ. He didn't come just to have a sermon to preach on Christmas. He came to save the world that's lost. And if you're lost this morning, he's calling each one of us to come to a place of repentance. Nicodemus came to him by night. Nicodemus was a was of the Sanhedrin court. He was a Pharisee. And uh, he knew the law. He knew the scriptures. And he came to Jesus privately by night. And he said, good master. And he said, oh, you're a teacher come from God, or you wouldn't be able to do these things that you do. Jesus told him, he said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus had never been to a Pentecostal church in 2023, <laughs> so he didn't know what that meant. What do you mean you've got to be born again? Some people think that's, that means you just got to think right in your head, but you're wrong. Some people think I just got to go to a church and be baptized but it's more than that. Some people think, well, I just got to join a church and pop in every once in a while on a Sunday. But to be born again means to be born. Jesus, Nicodemus said, what, can a man enter his mama's womb the second time and be born? What do you mean born again? And he said, the wind blows where it listeth, but you can't see where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. He said, don't marvel because I said you must be born again. He said, you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. I can't, uh, everybody's uh, experience is different. But on October 28, 1984, years ago, went to church hoping to be my last time because Dad made me go to church religiously. We went to church when the preachers didn't show up. That's the truth. We lived in church 
And I was I was forced to go to church as I got older. I become a teenager. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to sit and listen to all them crazy people. Made me sick, smiling and shaking hands all the time. I thought there's one thing in the world I'll never be and never be a preacher. <laughs> didn't like me. And uh, I had moved out from home and Dad called me. I went Sunday morning and uh, Dad called me that night. He said, you're going to church tonight? And I said, well, I'd rather not, Dad. He said, well, I tell you what, if you come tonight, I'll never ask you again. I thought, hot diggity dog. That's, that's better than, uh, what's his name? Let's make a deal. I thought, surely I can squeeze through one more service. Went to church that night, had three Colombian marijuana joints rolled up in my billfold. Sorry, Mom. Hired down below my shoulder blades. And uh, sat there on that pew lap that night and went with my girlfriend and bunch of kids with us, and they were sitting behind us in the pew, and we goofed off and talked off, and didn't hear a word that the preacher said. Then uh, the service was over. I thought, hot dogs, this is the end of it, baby. He said, will you stand? From the time that I left that seat, I stood up. I can't tell you what happened, but the convicting power of the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. You see, that's why it don't matter what my performance is up here. God can get a hold of you, and when he does, you need to respond. You need to respond because it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Friend, it's God speaking to you. And I began to shake, and I thought, what in the world is wrong with me? He started giving an altar call, and he gave two or three chances, and he said, one more time, is anybody here that needs to be saved? I knew something wasn't right and I wanted to be saved. All of a sudden, I seen my life flash before me and I knew I was lost. I'd never known I was lost before, but I felt as lost as I could be. And uh, he said, that's it. I'm not going to ask anymore. And I thought, that's all right with me, buddy. I'm coming anyway. Come out of that pew, ran to that altar and fell down, bawling, didn't know why I was crying. I can remember tears running out of my face and dripping on the altar and Dad was playing the altar call music on the piano and I guess he looked over and when he saw me, the, I heard the piano stop. I'm crying and bawling and tears are flying. All of a sudden I, I hear a big thump and Dad falls behind me and I hear him praying, his hot tears running down the back of my neck. I tell you what, you can say whatever you want to say. I experienced it for myself. You come too late to tell me that God ain't real. I, hallelujah to God today. I tell you, even if all summer shakes my mind, he'll never take the experience that God gave to me on that day. So Jesus is God's wonderful Christ. If you don't know him today, you need to be saved. You need to give your life to him. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you need to be born again. As they come to the music this morning.